What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the My Other Passion Podcast. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports. Today, we have famed NFL running back Ricky Williams on the pod. We had an amazing conversation. We talked for quite a long time, but that's because this guy has so much to talk about. He's running multiple businesses. He's super into astrology. He used to play as himself in Madden back when he was the best player in the game. He has so much to say about life, about ego, about finding yourself, about facing your demons and your insecurities about where we're headed over the next several years as a culture. I loved talking to Ricky Williams. I can't wait for you to hear the conversation. We may as well just get right into it. But first, let's hear from our partners at NetSuite. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's true when your business is growing fast, but that's even more true when there's a lot of uncertainty like there is right now. Inflation is running rampant. Supply chains are clogged. The labor market is tight. What does all this mean for your margins? Well, not every business is in the dark. Over 31,000 businesses know everything about their numbers because they use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite's going to give you the visibility and control you've been needing over your financials, budgets, planning, of course, inventory, everything that you need to manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve those margins. And best thing of all is it's all in one place. In 2022, profit is the new growth, and NetSuite's going to help you realize that. It's going to help you identify rising costs, automate your manual business processes, and really just see where to save money. Know your numbers, know your business, and get to know how NetSuite can be the source of truth for your entire company. Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Go ahead and head over to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion to take advantage of it. Again, netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Type it in, head there now, and change your business. My man, Ricky Williams, thank you for joining the pod. What's going on with you today? You know, just just another day working, working hard. You know, I feel like it's that, uh, that skit from In Living Color with the Jamaican family. You know, I got 15 jobs, so uh, staying on the go. Yeah, you know what they say. It's like, it's good to be busy, right? What's what's the driving force in your life right now? Like, what's got you so busy and, and what's keeping you inspired these days? You know, in, in general, growth, you know, growth. Uh, that's kind of abstract in the way it's manifested in my life is, is really in, like starting these businesses. And I feel like as a, you know, at, at midlife, starting business is really about taking things that I've learned from my first 45 years on the planet and, and putting them out into the world. I agree. I mean, I, I'm i 33 myself. We were just talking before we hit record about how things start to change as you get older and your perspective changes and, you know, what what becomes important to you and how your values develop. It's all really interesting to see as the years go on. Um, and I think a lot of us have followed your journey since you were a kid, essentially. So it's pretty interesting to see where you're at now. Um, I do have some things from your background and from your storied history and career in football that I want to get into and get some context on, especially with you being able to look back, you know, 20, 15 years later. Um, I, I love hearing people's perspective once some years have passed, but I do want to start with with right now, these businesses that you're building. Um, I know Heisman is at the forefront of that. I know you have your hands in a couple other things. And can you just give us that breakdown about what your life is about right now and what you're really trying to do when you build these businesses, when you spend your time running around doing 15 jobs all day? Yeah. No, it's, it's cliche, but it, it really is my everyday life that it really is about giving back. You know, I, I've had a lot of amazing experiences in life. And when I got to the point where I realized if I'm just doing it for me, it, it doesn't, it, it's not fulfilling. And so I, I say I, there's really three main businesses that I'm daily engaged in. And the first one is, is Heisman. And, you know, on paper, I'm the president and, you know, I'm involved in majority of the day to day, but really I hold the vision, you know, and I run the board. Um, second, which uh, the, the company where I'm actually the CEO, so I'm making all the making all the decisions, is a is an app an app I started developing back in 2018. Uh, we're getting there, and and then I have my personal uh, astrological consult, uh, consulting practice, and I, I talk to anywhere between 10 and 15 people a week. So 
Um, and all those are about really giving back and, and helping people feel better. So astrology is a big thing for you? It's everything for me. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I wake, it's the first thing, it's, it's kind of the first thing I think of when I, when I wake up and it's something that I, I'm thinking about on, in, on some level pretty much throughout the day. Okay. You sound, you sound like my wife, if I'm going to keep it real. Um, but you know what? I mean, that is a compliment because obviously yeah. <laughs> I'm a big fan yeah. of hers, but you know, the co-star app, like I was always just, Hey, I'm December 1st. I'm a Sagittarius. And I've, I've always had like an appreciation for it because I do think between the moon and the tides, like there's something real going on. And I think too many of us, sometimes there's like those vague things that it's like, Oh, of course that works. Cause, but there's certain things that they say about Sagittarius that I'm like, yeah, you, you got us down. And I don't think this is confirmation bias. Um, but I think my world opened up a bit when you start thinking about the rising moon and all these different, yeah. like there's so many aspects to it. Um, what's the deal with like business? Are you just a consultant and people tell you their birth charts and you come in and tell them things about their lives or like, how does one make a business out of that? What's the name of the business? Like that's, that's something that I really, I got to understand the full context. Yeah. So around. there's, there's, there's two businesses. One is, is they're connected. One is we call it Lila, L I L A. And Lila is a Sanskrit word that means the divine play. And, and for me, like when most people talk about astrology, you're into astrology, most people are talking about horoscopes. But for me, this is something that I've been studying for 20 years. And so I'm down to like all the planets, the house, all that stuff, you know? And it's like anything, the more you understand something, the more you can appreciate whether this is useful or not. Okay. And for me, like, I'm not going to waste my years, 20 years studying something if, if I don't find it extremely useful. Um, and so I'm trying to extend that, the, extend the usefulness that I found in astrology to other people. And uh, just a quick origin story. Okay. So 2004, I would walk away from the NFL and I'm lost. Okay. I mean, I know I don't want to be a football player anymore, but I have no idea like where I'm going or even really understand what's going on. Okay. And I meet this woman and she asked if I know what time I was born. And I knew cause I'm a, I'm a twin. I have a twin. So it's part of our story. So what I told time, her, by the she, way? What's 150, 157 PM, okay, May cool. 21st, 1977. So she Wait, put the Does that make you, aren't you like cuss? Were you Gemini or? On the first day, on the first day of Gemini. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I, I always love the fact, um, I'm 12.01 a.m. or something, and I think I would have still been a Sag, but, like, I just, I love December 1st. I feel like it's a lot of difference between the fact that I'm December or if I was November 30th. But back to you, you're in the afternoon, May 21st, this person asks you, what happens? So, so it was funny. That before she asked for my birthday, someone told her I was a football player. And so she came up to me, and her first thing she said to me was, where's your Mars? And I, I didn't know, I had no idea what she was talking about. But come to find out, Mars is the planet of competition. So in order to be a football player, you have to have a strong Mars. Okay? So I ended up giving her my birth information. And this woman didn't know me. Okay, We just met. And we, we talked for about three hours. And after those, those three hours, I felt like I felt more seen by this woman than anyone in my life at a, at a very cru crucial time in my life where I was feeling lost. And the fact that she doesn't know me, but she could understand in a way that no one else could what I was going through. I was like, whatever, whatever helped you understand that I need to learn. I need to, I need me some of that. And so she started teaching me the basics. And once I learned the basics, I just dove in, dove in. So okay. So now the question of the business, now the question about the business. Yeah, yeah. So, so it started off, it just, you know, my, my wife's really been big into yoga. And so she started just bringing some of her friends from yoga to the house. And th those are my first clients. Okay. And it was just, the, I spent 90 minutes, half hour and a half talking to people and really just explaining to them their chart. So I, I don't really do readings. I more educate people on how to understand themselves from an astrological or a cosmic perspective. Because I think so many times we only see ourselves in the context of our of our gender or our race or our family. And those things are important, but they're they're external, you know? And there's something inside that we all experience. And I think for me, being able to to identify myself as a as something more than just my physical body it made more sense and it, and it gave me much more insight to, to, to live a more fulfilling life. 
And so as I, as I talk to people, there's a whole range of people, you know, but my goal when I talk to someone is to, at the end, one, to help them feel seen, but two, to help them feel like their life has some bigger meaning, you know, than just carrying out their, their physical bodily functions. Um, so how do you, yeah. well, how do you feel about someone or people like people are kind of either like in love and obsessed and looking at their charts or at least reading their horoscopes every day, or they're like vehemently opposed and they think it's like quack, mad science. And, and you know, it's like, like I mentioned earlier, it's a lot of confirmation bias. It's like, of course I'm down and I'm going through something. So if someone says, Hey, next week, things are going to look up. Like, of course I'm going to believe in that. So like, what is someone who's spent you know decades of their life devout, devoted to this, you know, have to say about the legitimacy of it. So, you know, my thing, I, I prefer the skeptic. I much pre- prefer, much, much prefer the, the skeptic because with the people that are already in the true believers, that's confirmation bias. You know, right. I talk to people that are really into astrology. They have no idea. They have no idea what they're talking about, right? They can recognize a couple of the symbols. And then they, like you said, they attribute everything to that. The people who are skeptics, I love them because I'll look at their chart and I'll just because to me astrology doesn't it doesn't predict, you know, it's a it's a way to understand what makes us tick, you know. Like an example is, and this is the the trippy experiences that made me like really study this. Okay, I've talked about the planet Mars. The woman asked me, "Where's your Mars?" Okay, so when you read books, first you read mythology books, and it says Mars is the god of war. Okay. And so you think, okay, combative. And then I look at someone's chart and I see that Mars in their chart is really like saying something loud and I'm listening to them and the stories they tell are about all the stress, the fights, the injuries. Okay. All of the things that I saw in the book are associated with Mars. And after you see this a hundred, 200 times, right. It's not even like you believe, but it's this, it's more of a curiosity of like, what, what is going, what is going on? And I found through my my studies of astrology that I understand the world better, not necessarily external, but I learned to trust what my heart tells me because I've checked I've checked it out over time. Yeah, well, I love that. And I think I could really relate to that. I'm not quite as much of an enthusiast, but I do have a lot of love for astrology. And I just think right now, whether you're really in this space or right or not, there's something about coming of age and starting to have more perspective about your life and starting to, you know, that sense of, okay, things happen for a reason, something that, you know, seemed like the worst thing in the world a year ago actually opened me up for something I couldn't have even foreseen. Um, I've done a lot of, you know, reading and just organically follow your story from, you know, being in, in middle school and high school when you really started becoming famous um but looking at it now i i wonder and i get some inspiration from this like sense of acceptance that sort of emanates from you um you know i've seen you talk about some of the controversies and things you've been through it and it's always like you know i found peace with that or you know it seems like you've made some sense of things but can you can you take us how one gets there. Cause like, for instance, you talk about 2004, you got your first, you got your first retirement. I think there's like a few big things that come to mind immediately when you hear the name Ricky Williams. And, and part of that is those first like five years, those crazy ups and downs of those first five years in the league that leads to a retirement five years in. Um, you've said that that was a low point for you, that you were lost, but then it was also kind of great because you found yourself. What is the truth about that experience for you? That it was, it was, it was all of those things, you know, that it was a, a form of a death. And I think death, the definition of a death is a low point, you know, they put you six feet under, under, um, but after death comes a rebirth. And so I, I died as a football player and a sense of me had known for five years that that part was dying, but it, you know, hang, hanging on, I was hanging on. And the reality of it is, is that, you know, what I'm here to do on this earth, I needed to, to be doing it and not wasting my time entertaining people by running up and down a football field, you know? And, and I tried to ignore that truth, but it just got louder and louder and louder until finally I couldn't ignore it anymore. 
Um, and so, yeah, it was a it was a low point, but it was one of those where I hit the bottom and I sprung right back up. It was almost like the moment after I retired, I felt this huge weight lift off my shoulders, like this pressure to be some to prove something was gone. And I got the opportunity to actually be myself. And and I think I had put myself in such a like a prison trying to fit the role of what a, a professional athlete was supposed to be in in the early 2000s that when I finally got free, you know, I was I was gone. And so it was the the feeling of liberation felt so good to me that I couldn't help but trust it. And I think that's what carried me through the ups, the ups and downs. And so what you said earlier about giving back, do you feel like that was ultimately what you found to be your purpose? Like you're not here to run a football up and down the field to entertain people. So you are here to give back. Is that what it is? Well, I mean, that, that's, that's one way to say it. If, if I'm being more specific, I think you already, you already pointed it out. So when I think about like, what is the purpose of fame? And even when I go back to 12 years old, watching Notre Dame football, making the decision, I want to be the best college football player ever. Okay. Even that decision was based on the idea that I will have a platform, you know, that if I'm famous, people will have to listen to what I say. And so when I got to the NFL, won the Heisman Trophy, broke all the records, I thought, finally, people are going to listen to what I have to say. And then I started talking and they said, you're weird. Why are you saying that? You no. Know? And then I was like, damn, this is not this is not what I thought. And, and it's funny. I didn't, I mean, I tried to hide the fact that I was using cannabis. You know, I didn't think that was going to, that was going to, or mental health, right? Things that were taught to hide. Who knew that was really going to be the platform that I, that I got to stand on? And I've realized I've touched, I've inspired way more people by, by my advocacy for mental health and for, and for cannabis and even for astrology than I have inspired people running up and down the football field. So what are those days mean to you now you found so much purpose in sort of the, the the second act of your life but you had the rushing record in 2002 you were pro bowl you got the heisman in 98 the saints gave up every single draft pick for you, you have a lot of like iconic moments on the field um do you find that there's like that you've almost like pushed away whatever those mean to you or there's maybe a hint of resentment or something or you know, is that just what it is? Like, I, I wonder because people like dream their whole life for those things and you get them, but you also realize that they didn't mean everything to you. And then what do they mean to you? Once they realize they are not everything, do they become nothing or does it become something that's just like, you know, one little piece of your story that you're proud of or, or does it mean a lot? Do you wake up and look at the Heisman every day still, even though you've moved on from it? Like, you know, what is, what does it all mean after you reach a little bit of enlightenment? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, and it's funny. I, I think I've been trying to run away from it mainly because when somebody meets me, usually, right. The first thing that comes to their mind whether they know the story or not, they look at me and they hear football player, they have a certain image that comes to their mind. And I feel like who I actually am in most people's mind is very different from that image. And so a lot of the times I've, I felt like I'm, like I'm invisible. Who I truly am is invisible because people get stuck on what's on the outside. So I, I felt like I had some kind of resentment about that. But recently I'm realizing I don't do well with, with resentment. So even when I try to have it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And I realized that I have to integrate all of those things because there's no second act without a without a first act. And I'm realizing, you know, the 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 warrior, the like the grit, like the the part of me that loved to go to battle, the part of me that that doesn't make excuses. Like all of those things are the reason that I'm successful in what I'm doing now. And because I've survived all of those things, right, and kept my wits and kept my my contentment. Right. I, I can tell <laughs> I can tell stories about them without sharing, giving people all my baggage, you know, and I think that's so rare in the world. You know, someone who can who can share who's been through things and can give you clarity and not just share their stuff, their hang ups around it. Um, so so I integrate integration. It, it really is all about integration, you know, because the past is always pushing us to a future. And if we can't come to terms with the past, we get stuck and we can't move into the future. The past is crazy. I think I have this theory. I've talked about it with friends or some other people at FOS. I think nostalgia, there's like there's almost like a nostalgia industry now 
Because just think about every movie that's coming out as a remake, as a reboot, they're remastering video games. Every, you know, artist comes out with, you know, album, Donda 2 or what have you. It's always about a sequel, a continuation. And I think, like, there's there's this comfort in going back to the past. And there's this, like, fear that people have about letting go of it and and moving on to something new. So I just... I love hearing this from you. It's something that I've bounced around in my head for like months and years now. And you're such a great example of someone who can like really bring some perspective to that conversation. Um, but one thing from the past, if we want to be nostalgic, you were an absolute beast in Madden. Um, my cousin, his first football jersey was yours. And a lot of it had to do with like, you were really unstoppable in that game. Um, I just have to ask as a gamer, like, it's honestly not much that deep to it. I'm just, did you, were you like aware of the legendary status in that game? Did you play as yourself? Like, uh, did it not matter much? Cause it was just like some, something out there, but all the real, like kind of hardcore game nerds know that, that, that Madden 01, 02, you were like one of the cheat codes. And I just want to hear from like the man yeah, yeah. himself. So yeah, so for me, my my I'll call not Madden. I'll call my EA journey. My okay. my playing with myself. Okay, it started back in 1995, my freshman year, NCAA football. Okay, and I when I came to Texas, I was a fullback, and so in that game they had the triple option where you could give it to the fullback, right, or you could run the option. Okay, so I was playing that game every single day, running the triple option, giving the ball to myself, running people over, and that continued sophomore year junior year, senior year, and it continued all up into the NFL. Even to this day, you know, when I play Madden, I play ultimate team and I put myself at tailback or fullback if I can catch balls out of the backfield. And um, yeah, to me, that that was the highlight. The highlight of my career was getting on video games and being able to to play with myself. You're so serious? You would come, put... That you, didn't come out you, right, but... Well, <laughs> but would you really put that up against uh, any other accolade? Like that was truly like one of the top experiences? Because to me, you know, you mentioned this earlier, there's the, the, the accolades are external, you know, and I think any anyone who's achieved these things will tell you the same thing. The actual reward is the experience of, of going through it, you know, and and so I can't go out and play football anymore, but I can go on Madden and still have that internal that internal experience. And even as a kid, you know, I was a gamer. And so when I thought of like making it, you know, I wasn't thinking about getting hit. I was thinking about, you know, people can play people can play as me and I can play with myself. So those are the things I feel like the true value in life is at the end of life. Those experience, those nostalgic experiences right that that lift us up but they don't stick us you know you mentioned nostalgia and i think there's a there's a nostalgia that sparks creativity and provides some kind of warmth okay like i'm not having a bad day i promise you i'm putting on the the highlight films right because it's hard to have a bad day when i see what i'm capable of you know right. hard to have a bad day when i see what i'm capable of so it's there but i think what you're speaking of and what i see sometimes is people they 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 go to nostalgia because it seems like they're afraid. To it's be the creative. it's the Ricky Williams who can't sit and have a conversation at dinner without being like, "Remember when I did this? Remember when I did that? Like, who are you now?" Exactly, exactly. And and that was my that was my biggest fear is I don't want to be defined by what I did in the past. Like I appreciate people can respect what I've done, but when they think when they expect me to be so excited about something I did fifteen years ago, like, I yeah. It, it just doesn't work for me. Right. So if we jump to the present, and like you mentioned from the beginning, the first thing you said, Heisman is a really big part of your present. Uh, it's the business that you are, you know, seriously focused on, perhaps the most focused on. Um, and I would love to hear about, like, the operations, the strategy behind that. But you mentioned cannabis. You mentioned the retirement that was linked to cannabis. And I think – we really need to get some understanding about the truth of what that means to your story. Look, you've talked about it a bunch. I've seen, uh, I saw a story recently where you were talking about how you're a rookie and there's a hall of famer who is showing you like cannabis along with other things is part of how you take care of yourself in the NFL. 
also we're at a space where I saw Draymond Green's wedding. He had a blunt bar and like they don't even test for it in the NBA anymore. And I'm sure the attitude has still changed in some ways in the NFL. So you've seen this, <laughs> you've seen this culture like 180 almost, but what are those early 2000s, mid 2000s days like? You know, I remember like the scrutiny, this guy quit so he could smoke and, you know, and then you say like part of your mission is to elevate the legitimacy of cannabis. But, but like, how do you get to this point? What, what actually happened? Like what actually happened 20 years ago? Yeah. You know, the, the, the theme that runs through it and it's like to this day, it still shows up is I have an idea. Right. I just have a sense. I don't have proof. I just have a sense. And part of me says, I, I need to go check out to see if this idea is real or if it's, if it's not. Okay. And so, um, fast forward to early two thousands, I started, I really started like smoking on a daily basis when I was in new Orleans. So I ended up breaking my ankle and about the same time, a good friend of mine from high school moved in and she's a smoker. And so it became like a ritual after work, I'd, I'd smoke and then get up and go to work and kind of do that. And I found a nice like rhythm and I found a really nice rhythm. And then I got traded from, from New Orleans to, to Miami. And since I got that rhythm, I found, I found somebody down in Miami and I kept that rhythm, kept the rhythm going. Um, and aside from feeling good, I started to notice in those, you know, in the off season when I'd smoke and I had downtime that my mind started going different places. I started considering my life outside of just being a football player. I started having other interests. I started reading. Okay. And as I started opening my mind more, you know, what I was doing as a football player started making less and less sense. You know, this idea that the only value I have is to destroy my body for, for money and, and adoration that I don't even value that much. You know, and I realized the reason I was doing this was for freedom, but I'm not free. And so, you know, allowing my mind to think like this, I just got to the point where it didn't make sense anymore. And I said, I, I'm, I'm leaving. And so it's, it is partially true that I left to, to smoke, but it was is more about a lifestyle. And a lifestyle is one that I'm living, I'm living like what I live in according to what my heart says, not according to what the world says to me. And in my experience, I had no idea what my heart was telling me until I started smoking. And I'm not saying that's the only way to contact, to, to do it, but I'm saying I didn't expect that. But as I started smoking, I got, I started to get to know myself better. And I realized a lot of the choices I was making in life weren't good for me, right? They might look good from the outside, but for my nature, my soul, they were not good for me. And so that gradual shift, I started making choices based on how I felt on the inside. And to me, you know, I got into yoga, meditation, a lot of mindfulness practices, and I put can astrology, I put cannabis in that same, in that same category, you know, and, and people talk about mental health. It, it's a, it's a hot, it's a hot button topic right now. And, and the, you know, when I, when I try to simplify what is mental health, Okay. Mental means that it's something in here and health has to do with feels pretty good. And I realized my mental health didn't start to improve until I, until I started to pay attention to it. You know? And so when I talk about cannabis now, I, I, I talk about it as a mental health issue of, you know, because to me, it's not about smoking or not smoking or, or drinking, whatever you do to me is what do you do afterwards? I'm not going to judge a person for what he puts in his mouth. I'm going to judge a person for what comes out of his mouth. Yeah, it's it's interesting the the way the dynamic has changed. Do you So, let's we already talked about the way the stigma has changed with cannabis, but even mental health. I think, you know, during the time when you first started being vocal about it, it was a different climate. It was this guy's weak. This guy, it, it's a criticism. It's something that opens you up to criticism. And there's still a bit of that now, but there's so much more compassion for it. There's so much more understanding. And how do you make the jump from being at the forefront of these things that have become like really regular and frequent in our culture to turning it into something that is a business and I say that like with caution because I know 
I get the sense that you're not the type of person that's like, yeah, I love this thing and I found free. So now let me capitalize and profit off of it. Like, at least that's, that's what I get from talking to you. You seem like a real grounded spiritual dude. Um, but at the same time, you do have a company like, like what is Heisman about? Because I think when people see it at first glance, it just seems like, Hey, here's the guy who's kind of like famous for smoking in the NFL. And now he's capitalizing off of it. He's going to, have a strain. I mean, look, it's cool. Every Everybody's doing it now. But, you know, is that really it? Is it like, yeah, I'm known for this and I do have an opportunity to capitalize? Or is there like some message you're trying to spread? Is there some higher goal? Like what what is this company about and what are you all going to do? Yeah. Wow. These, you know, get right to it. So, of course, I mean, you can tell for me everything I do, there's some kind of greater, greater purpose to it. Um, and, you know, and, and one of the things I think underlying all of it is I want to show people that that it works, that you can be yourself and turn that into a business. And so but but to me, the, the starting point of that, and I think, unfortunately, it seems like businesses have lost this this concept. But if you if you want to be successful in business, you have to provide something of value. All right. And so the conversation I have with my team on a daily basis, okay, I got to remind them, we're not just selling weed, okay? We have to produce something of value, okay? And I think, okay, what, what is the most valuable thing that I have? To me, it's my experiences, you know? And so I remember when I was going through all my stuff with cannabis, there was nobody talk, talking about cannabis the way that I talk about it now. There was no one even offering a serious different perspective. And so when I was trying to find some support and some help, there was nothing there. There was a void. And I and I made it a mission to do whatever I can to fill that void. And so to me, a business is bringing something of value forward. You know? and, and part of it, the biggest part is the conversation. You know, I, I believe the greatest gift you can give to someone is say the thing to them that no one else will say to them. Okay? That's priceless. Or how many times have we had a friend, someone we care about, like point something out to us that we could not have seen on our own. And that like that pointing now gave us permission to show up in a different way. You know? yep. And, and, and just it, someone who can be honest and, and transparent with you. You know, I don't know how, how much of a music guy you are, um, but Devil in a New Dress, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, that's like an iconic Rick Ross verse, Miami connection. But... Um, he has an amazing story about how Kanye came in after he dropped the first verse and said, this is whack. Like you're Rose, you can do better. And then he gave us like literally one of the best verses of all time. But that comes from not being scared to someone that you love and you appreciate being able to check them or just be honest with them or give them a perspective that lives outside of their own. Yes. Yeah. And so, and I mean, that that's right in alignment with why I consume cannabis and why I'm launching this, this company. And, you know, the, the bigger, the bigger picture is that, so I grew up in a very religious family. Okay. This like is in San Diego, be, right? Yeah. In San Diego. Yeah. My dad's, a, my dad's a preacher, still a preacher. My dad's mom's a preacher. My mom's mom's a preacher. So I was in church all, all week. Okay. And so my religious background is very much at the core and foundation of who I am. Right. And to me, the definition of religion is trying to live trying to live right. Okay. Right. And so I, you know, until I hit puberty, right. It was easy. <laughs> it was easy. You no, know? then the hormones kicked in and it got more complicated. Right. So living right became more complicated. So I think I shifted my folk, my religious focus to being a football player and living right in that sense was being the best football player I could be and chasing fame. Right. I think that's the underlying religion of our modern times. Okay. And, and I got to the top of that religion and realized it was empty. And so I was looking for a, a greater sense of how to live right. Okay. And that's when I found astrology. And I found that, that to live right, in, in my opinion, you have to see how, where you fit in the larger scheme of things. Okay. Whether that's your family, that's your community, that's your, your city, your state, your, your country, the world is you got to have some connection to something greater. You know, and, and I realized for me, like that, that was my, that was my religion. And so I'm trying to get people, cause I see people are lost and maybe a lot of people are lost cause they don't have that connection or that meaning. And so I, I feel like cannabis, astrology, okay. Meditation, all these things help me connect to that. 
And so I think the greatest value I can I can give is to give other people that opportunity to do what I can to make it cool to put it out there so they have access to these to these technologies. So you're coming from this really noble place, but of course we live in a capitalist society. So there needs to be some upside to it. And how is business? You launched in fall 2021. So you're coming up on a year of Heisman. Is this, has it been worth its while? You know, is it, is it sucking up all your money or are you actually, you know, on a path toward or already profitable? Like, you know, like I told you, front office sports is about that business. And we see so many people coming out with lines and strains or collaborating. You actually just, I saw uh, you got the, the partnership with Tilt. You got a couple other things happening in the arena. Um, so like, what is it actually like from a performance standpoint from you, uh, for you almost oh. a year in? Yeah. So is I'm going to be honest. So when we first launched the company, okay. I was I was running Leela, you know, and it was taking up pretty pretty much all my time. But I really believe that Heisman was a good idea. And so the idea was, you know, I'll hold the vision, but you know, we'll find a team, we'll put them together and they'll they'll run it. Okay. And so we started off like that. And as you know, things started going, I realized I don't like the way the direction that it's headed. And so I interjected myself back into it. And that was a little rocky, you know, and I, and it's funny, I mentioned What did, what didn't you, you like know, about it though? What didn't you like about it? Um, so when, when we first launched, right, the idea was the intersection between cannabis and sports, okay, the intersection be between cannabis and sports. And that's real, that's catchy, it makes sense, it follows my story. But the reality is, I spend very little, very small amount of my time interacting and connecting to sports, you know, literally, my head is in the clouds, you know, I'm looking at the stars, I still I still interact with sports. But but it was more the superficial idea of me play, being an athlete and, and supporting that, not the heart of the heart of a warrior, that whatever life, whatever life brings at us, you know, we can we take it on as a challenge. OK. And and to me, that, that's a that's an underlying theme behind mental health. Because when, when I was struggling with my mental health, okay, I, I would go to work and I didn't want to be there. I felt like I just want to put a towel over my head. I'm miserable. OK. And I had no idea what was going on. And then one day I was watching TV and a commercial for Paxil came on and it was about social anxiety and it was listing all of it. And I was like, I got like nine or 10 of those. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went, <laughs> I went to start seeing a therapist and we started, you know, we started talking, we started going back and forth and I started to like, like learn about myself a little bit. You know, I started to, to like realize that there was, that there was more going, there was more going on with me. And, and that made a major, major impact on me in, in my life. And it really- So is that how you interjected? Basically you said, look, this is about more than this kind of cliche sports and cannabis. So you interject yourself. That's, I, I'm assuming like a few months into the operation. And then what direction do things take from there? Well, it, it, so I interject myself and it was kind of this pushback like, that's that wasn't the plan. That wasn't what we signed what we signed up for. And, and the truth is, the people that I hired weren't living. They weren't actually living the lifestyle. They weren't living the Heisman lifestyle. You know, the idea was we're going to get on this boat and ride it, and it is going to take us. And I was, and I said no. You know, and I said, listen, I, like I might hold the vision, but if this is going to be successful, all of you have to step up and li and like actually live it. And so I I changed everything around, and I realized like. They don't, they're, they don't know how to live it. This is something that I have to show them. And so I started creating appointments. You know, I did astrological readings for everyone on the team and I started to meet with them every, every week, right? And, and here's what I learned. First of all, I feel like men, and this is, I'm generalizing, okay? But I feel like most men, right? We don't start to do work on ourselves until we end up in rehab, you know? Or couples therapy, right? Something bad has to happen and we're forced to like talk about it. And then we have that realization. We, we can be more real. And I noticed with at least the, the guys that were working with me, it was like wherever they lacked confidence, they would hide it and pretend that they had confidence and they wouldn't ask for help. And, I, and so when we started talking one on one and I got to the under, underneath, like who these people are, my message to them was, I, I know this is your title and this is what you're supposed to do. But if your heart's not in it, you're just going to come up with excuses not to do it. So I really encourage people to like tap into like what they love and let's find a place 
in this format where you can do what you love. And what blew my mind is to me, if someone said that to me, I'd be like, yeah, but they pushed back, right? They fought for doing something that they really didn't want to do. But I, you know, I stuck, I stuck with them. And then finally, right. And it's just time, right. Cause they hear me highfalutin talking all this stuff, you know, <laughs> matter of fact, we, we were having one conversation and it got heated, you know, I was doing my thing and, and our, my, my CEO that I hired, you know, he said, I'm tired of you pontificating. And I was like, Whoa, right. right. You know, and it was like, <laughs> I was like, this is not pontificating. This is real. But I realized they have to see it in action over time to build that trust. And I think when I say my crazy things and they work out in the end, then the guys start to trust and they start to buy in and they start to believe. It's almost the exact same trajectory I saw year in, year out as a football player. And I kind of had to take on that role of being the head coach in the sense of getting everyone aligned with the vision and on the same page. And as soon as I introjected myself and took control as a true leader, right, everything's, everything started to hit. Leading up to them, people loved what we were doing. So we had so much support. You know, we killed it. We did an amazing friends and family round. You know, people were not even asking questions, just just throwing money at us. Okay. Right. And, how and much did you guys, all raise? How much you all how, how much have you all raised thus far? Uh, so we raised about six hundred in the friends and family round, and then we raised another six hundred in a seed round. And right now we're uh we're about to close our A round where we're gonna wait raise another uh, another two. Um so, so, but, you know, we hit a, we hit a point where everyone, you know, you, you know it, but everyone, you know, worrying about, I don't want to dilute ourselves, you know, and I'm like, listen, you guys, you guys are worried about the wrong thing. Number one thing here is we have to focus on creating value, authentic, real value, right? And that doesn't come from my name. That comes from all of you, like contributing something of value that, and we all work together to, to, to create this. And, and, you know, we keep getting more and more on the same page. And as we do, we keep picking up momentum, you know? And so it's, it's just now in the past couple of weeks, really starting to get fun. Right. So past couple of weeks, then first, that's, that's a lesson in perseverance and honestly, just how business goes. I think a lot of times people come in, you know, you get a piece of something or it shows its promise because it has a certain name attached to it. And everybody has like rich overnight fantasies. And it's a lot of work between that rich overnight is like a decade of grinding. Um, but my wife, where are you my at? Wife, Bo- like, real quick, my wife, my wife complaining about the guys, right? They just want to be nares. They just want to be nares, you know, not realizing it, it's years and it's hustle and it's work and it's focus. Yeah, I never heard anybody say nares, but I like that. I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna use that moving forward. But so, so where have we arrived in these past couple of weeks? Now it's fun. Um, I, it seems like the mission is getting through, but again, like, and I understand that you're in a raise, you're raising, so like, you don't have to say it's not like you're a public company or anything. But, but what are you? What type of response are you seeing in the market? Like. Like everybody, it seems it's becoming more of a novelty, right? I see everybody has a wine, everybody has a cannabis strain, whatever. Is there, is this like drying up because it's getting oversaturated or are you seeing like, no, we can like really, we can really do something here. Like in all honesty, just, is it, is it a grind and it's kind of like tough and you're, and you guys are trying to wonder how you're going to actually like squeeze some profit out of this or are you, do you see the path? And it's like, okay, we actually all can be nares. We're like right there. Yeah. It's I been, know you it's already like are. A, Cause you had the pleasure of, you know, being a Heisman trophy winner and going to the NFL, but that's a, that's another conversation. It's, it's been like this, you know, it's been like the momentum was up and part of it is following the market, you know, because in, you know, when we launched was, it was the market was still buzzing from from COVID. Everyone, you know, was still at the very end of getting their unemployment checks. And then when you know the end of last year, every the whole market took a dive, right? But because of the, when we launched and the hype, we we were able to we were able to like to ride to ride the wave. And I yeah, think I'm still I'm still was... holding a bag from Sundial, by the way. Like <laughs> I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> I'll say like we've been we've been riding the hype. And that's given us enough time to start to create some actual substance, you know? And so we have been able to keep steadily growing with the ups and downs because of the, the hype we've created. But I think what we've done well is we've differentiated ourselves because we are different. 
you know, especially when it comes to quote unquote celebrity brands. You know, I'm the I'm the boots on the ground going to other dispensaries and talking to people and meeting the bud tenders. And so our, our attack is kind of twofold. There's the micro and the macro. OK, the micro is like the is really the business part of of sell through of getting cannabis into dispensaries and getting in and, and getting reorders. OK, and a lot of that is like PADs is boots on the ground. It, it's it, you, you got to devote time and effort to that. OK, um, and we're, we're just now starting to figure that out and we're starting to see see our product move. And again, I think it's a combination of doing the things that everyone else is doing with our special sauce because we are we are different. And the other is the macro. And that's really the mission of, of making this a national brand. And it's a lifestyle brand. You know, like when I think of of kind of what I'm aiming for, it's like the spiritual Nike. You know, because the truth is, if you go to Nike and we've done it, we go to Nike and we want to do some kind of joint event. They're anti anti cannabis, although a majority of their athletes are consuming cannabis. Right. It's right. So if they're not going to take it, you know, like we're going after it. But it's that same attitude of just do it, but applying it to not just competing on the football field, but but going going beyond. Yeah. And I've seen I live in L.A. My my homie has a, a chopped cheese truck. I think he was, he did the food at like your 420 event at Cookies or something like that. Um, I was supposed to pop out, but you know, FOS duties were calling. But I see what you're trying to do, and and I love your philosophy on things. And I want to revisit what you said about like men and ego and insecurity, um, just because I think someone who's like looking at their astrology charts every day might have some, some cool insight here. But I think what you said about like all these guys, they're actually like, they're overcompensating. Right. Um, that's something that I've wanted to explore just like as a young man, a product of the 20th century, 21st century culture. I think that part of the issue is like, we're almost like rewarded for doing that. Like you said, it's not until you hit rock bottom when you're in rehab, you're in couples therapy, and now you have to question all the media and garbage that's been fed to you your whole life, right? But coming up, and I've actually, as I'm entered my 30s and I have a son and I have a daughter, and I'm like questioning everything, right? And it's almost like we're told, you know, we're told violence, sex, all these things to aspire to. And then we're told to be almost like we're like bred to be arrogant. Right. And then it's, it's until you get like too successful or it comes around to bite you. But at a point it's like, you're, you're going to get passed over. They're going to, they're not going to like respond to you or you're trying to get a job or whatever. It's like, it becomes, it becomes a negative trait like when it's too late for a lot of us. And I'm wondering how that conversation changes for, for men, young black men, just in general. Like I love the mental health conversation that's happening because I feel like, like we're allowing more vulnerability, but I know the way you came up and the way I came up, whether you're a religious household or not a product of the times, it was, you know, ego above all by any means necessary. And it seems like you did some work to like break that down within the culture of your, your company. Yeah. It, it, it really was a breaking down. And again, I got it from what I learned, what I learned in football, because a football coach in order to get the best out of his players has to break the ego down. Cause if you got players with egos, you, you can't, you can't run a football team successfully. Um, and you know, you know, I, I'm already scary, scary looking enough. So I, I try to like, toned down my aggression, but I had a couple of like moments with the guys on the team where we like, we had to have it, like we had to have it out. And I think the, the, I have had this with one of my sons too. And I think there's this, to answer your question, I think it's up to us, the, the elders, right? Because we've been through it when we see it and we notice it to call it out, but to do it out of love, not to put someone down or punish them or even break them. Right. To do it out of love, because we realize, like you said, if you hold on to this, it's going to be too it's going to be too late. You know, it's going to be too late. I've seen homies whose like careers are trying to starting to take off and they're just posting crazy on social media and stuff. And just by virtue of things I've seen been through, I'd be like, yo, 
chill out. Like everybody knows you got it right now. And I'm glad you're proud and we're proud of you. But, you know, it gets to a point where it's like, you know, what is, what is, um, it's like, there's a couple of sayings about it. It's like, first they hate you, then they love you, then they hate you again. Or I love what Hove says, like, you know, when you first come in the game, they try and play you. Then you drop a couple of hits, look how they wave to you. It's like these things come and go. And you, how did you experience that as a player? How did you go from being like the most loved guy, setting records, winning trophies to like scrutinize, breaking news, ESPN, this degenerate weed smoking football player? Like, how does that affect someone's psyche? That's the, that's the low point. That's the low point, you know, but perspective and i'm so like i'm so glad i was smoking at the time because if i thought that's all that i was you know I, i'd have been scared for myself you know but i started to, to realize that there was more to me and the the learning about and developing that more to me started to become the most important thing in my life and that's and that's what saved me now it's funny i, I was, there's one of one of the guys i work with and he's got a lot of talent, you know, but but he's kind of that big ego thing, you know. And and it was funny. I was I was kind of messing with him one day, and I said, if you if you like put as much effort into your job as you did in chasing girls, like you, we we be killing it right now, you know. And I was kind of I was kind of messing with him, you know. It's kind of how Bill Parcells used to mess with me, and and we kind of went back and forth, and you know, we kind of would like fought back a little bit, but then when we got underneath it, he he realized something. You know, and this kind of this, and I, this is what I've realized, like so much of, of being a man is proving, proving that we're a man. But if you're proving that you're a man, you're not actually being anything, mm -hmm. you know? And I just. And so much of this stuff we want because of like, I loved, I love, love, love what you said about like, like rather than I just want to be like the fastest guy or run the most hard. It was because of what you thought that would bring to your life. Right. Like. I think so many of us want these things. We want to win an Oscar or we want to, you know, sell a million records and stuff. And sometimes it's like for the love of the game, it's for the purity. But so much of it's because finally people will respect me. They'll finally listen to me. I got to prove something. And like you either get to the point where you achieve that and you realize that that doesn't guarantee anybody's respect. In fact, it might increase the scrutiny. Um, and you also you know, get to the point where you realize like you can prove everything and like not everyone's gonna like you have to find that peace within. Um so like I don't know, bro. I I hearing a lot of this from you is just it's great timing because you know, this is stuff that I've been over the past few years. You know, you become a father and you just grow up. You know, you get out of the scene, you get out of being in the streets every night caught in the moment. And you can look at things with a little more perspective. And, you know, I've probably had some times of like, okay, is this, is this me? Is this my experience? Um, and then you talk to a friend, you connect with them. And now I'm sitting now talking to Ricky Williams and, and you're telling me the same thing. But I think I would love to see this awareness spread, you know, far and wide in our community. Um, and, and just as people, you know, men, women, whatever race, creed, like these are all things, like one thing I love about, the Bible. And I feel like we're having one of those combos. Like, like I love a combo like this. Like I'm like, wait, am I like at my job or are we just like sitting down having like a deep talk? But one thing I love about the Bible and I, it might resonate with you coming from a religious background. It's like, it shows you that there are certain tenets of, of, of humankind that have just been around forever. Like all these things, you might think your situation so unique because of how you and this guy fell out over whatever. And it's like, yo, it's been like this for thousands of years before they got into it because of the Instagram story post. It was because of the people in the town hall said whatever. It's like, there's just things about humans that I think, you know, have, have held us back for a long time. And so who's to say if we can ever really break out of those, but I think they're the beauty of now and the spread of information is this sense of awareness and is like, you know, being able to sit down and have these conversations and put them out in front of millions of people. And, you know, I hope, I hope it can turn the tide a little bit. I want, I want better for all of us. It will. I'm telling you, it's, it's planting seeds, you know, cause you, you see this with kids, right? You say something to them and you might say it a hundred times and you think they're not listening, you know? But then when you watch, you see that they're listening. So 
because the even if we block it right the words still go in they sit there until they're ready to sprout and so i think it might be five years it might be 10 years, it might be 20 years but it, the fact that we're saying these things you know the, the words are the words are getting out there yeah and you know you know what's real too it's like a lot of times everyone always says hey the conversation let's just talk about it and what does it mean but and, and is anything really changing but like I remember when skateboarding, when like dudes rocking like color in their dreads or in their hair, like all these things, this, or tighter pants, whatever stuff that twit. Like when you were in the league, when I was in high school, that was like weirdo behavior. You couldn't wear like, tight pants. They were terrible. That was <laughs> you had tight pants. Was, mm. Dog, there was mm. so, there was joints that I had in high school that would be considered baggy now that I wore then, and they were like, you got them tight jeans on. And, the, you know, and then I look back at a picture. I'm like, these are baggy, dog. That was tight. Um, but it's crazy because so much of that stuff was like weirdo, bully, get made fun of behavior. That is like the culture now. That is the standard now. And so obviously, like things do change. Um, so when you think about how things have changed, you I know you say sports is like, you know, a smaller percentage of where your head is at. But but what do you make of the league now? Like, you know, that, that TV rights deal last year was just absurd. You know, like a hundred billion plus for, for a decade. You got Amazon in the mix now. Um, you know, the game has changed just from, from the endorsements to the money, to the culture. Um, and what is like a veteran like you, you know, who saw it at a much different place, you turn on the TV or you, you know, you open up front office sports and, and you see, you know, a, an updated development about where the league is headed in a business sense or, you know, where the players are headed in a cultural sense. And like, what do you, what do you, what do you think about all of it? Well, you know, relative to the NFL, since, you know, I got into the league until now, it's been like a steady trajectory of growth. And I, you know, I was, I was part of the NFL union. And so I got to see the background and, and be a part of the negotiations of seeing of the progress. And I think it's wonderful in my sense is it'll at least, for the next decade or so, I see it continuing to, to climb. To me, the most interesting shift in sports business has been the NIL deals in, in NCAA. To me, that that's revolutionary because when I was coming up, it's like, you know, the, the joke was when the, the, the star player drives up in a fancy car and now all of the star players are driving up in, in fancy cars, you know? And so, so much of the, like the biggest taboo in college sports is now is becoming the norm and it seems somewhat unregulated. So it's, it's, it's amazing to me and, it, and it, it's wild to think, and I'm curious about the long-term effects of this to, to amateur sports, you know, and I'm a traditionalist in the sense of, I believe college sports should be amateur and amateur from the root of more meaning playing for the love of the game and not that money always taints the love of the game, but it, it can make it complicated, especially when you're young. No, and I'm just afraid it's with the with the transfer portal and the NIL deals that college sports are just it's it's pretty much already become professional sports, and I think you're going to lose the love of the game and the appreciation of a college education. But, so you don't you, know, f- you don't feel like yo I won the Heisman and I could have been a millionaire in '98. Like you don't have any um, sense of, well, cause you know, sometimes people get like, like bitter, whether it's cannabis or NIL, where it's like, how come I was getting criticized for things that are celebrated now? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not bitter. I, I would say if I did it, I would say, I think the money should go on a trust, you know, that comes to the player once they graduate. That, and I think of that just to, to honor the nature of college. I don't think the players should be exploited, but I also don't think an opportunity to get an education should be should be taken advantage of or exploited. You know? Um, but again, I, I think it's great that they're able to to make money. I, I mean, I hope that the, they're being educated. I, I wish I would have had this opportunity because when I did get to the NFL and the big money started coming, I would have had a little bit of practice. Right. Yeah. Everybody talks about that. I mean, obviously, I think like um, kind of a genesis of this conversation in popular culture was the 30 by 30, 30 for 30, um, you know, like broke. Right. Super famous. Um, and and now this this comes up in so many of the episodes of this pod, like 
I love seeing the kids who come in and say, I'm only spending my endorsement money, or they just like in the music industry, they want to own their masters or in the film industry. They want a percentage of the box office or all these different things that were like clandestine hidden in a contract somewhere that 18 year olds are aware of now. Um, what is it like to come into millions of dollars as a young man and it's pretty it's simple in the sense of like you know did you did you blow it did you have to learn through trial and error like you know ultimately like how did that pan out for you you say you say the big money started to come in and you weren't quite ready um was it something that you just you had a, a solid financial advisor and you figured out or you know you had issues because of course like you know you also peggy ann fulford you had like a very serious situation and you were defrauded of like a ton of money. And I think, or weren't you like the worst victim in that case? Um, yeah. So you've seen, me, you've seen, you said what? Okay, she got me, she got me for about six, six million, about six. Okay. Yeah. So you've so, seen the highs and lows of how this can go. So like, tell us, tell the kids coming in, you know, what you've seen, what you've learned and, um, and how we should approach our finances. Well, you know, I, I think you, you pointed it out that, you know, younger people are, are wanting to, to have more ownership, you know, like I think the, the equity, ah, right, that beautiful word, ownership, you know, and I think when you throw the, the, the cash at the young people, they just see the cash, not a, not able to see the bigger picture, you know, and I think for me, I grew up not, have, not having much, you know, and so by the time I got the big check, I had a long list of things that I that I wanted to do. You know, and I think there's 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 a couple of ways to play it. You know, there and you see it, right? I call people with strong Saturn, you know, or Capricorn. Okay, they come in and they say, you know, I'm still driving the I'm still driving the car I drove in college, and I'm only spending my endorsement money. I'm saving everything. Okay, that's not me. Okay, for me, in my attitude, the the value of money is the ability to do all the things that I really want to do. Okay, and so. I was figuring it out. Okay. So when I got my first check, I just put it in the bank, right? I was like, I don't want a financial advisor. You know, I don't need one. I, I, I can take care of myself. Okay. And, and I bought my mom a house. I bought myself a house and there's plenty of money left over and it was just in the bank. Okay. And it sat there for about a year and a half, two years. Uh, and then I got to this place where I was like, where I realized I need to live a little bit. You know, and so I made a couple of larger purchases. I got a, I got a new car. I got a new condo in New Orleans. Um, and then I got traded to Miami and I got a, a contract. I got a bigger contract. So I had more coming in and I felt I was comfortable. So I'm just going to stack, you know? And so I just started stacking. Um, and then 2004 came along and I retired. Okay. And thank goodness I had stacked because that's what let me retire. I said, okay, I, I don't need to play football anymore. I have enough money put away that I can go do my thing. Okay. And that's when the dolphins decided to sue me for, for everything I had. Okay. And so I retired, Dolphins sued me and they won the case. Okay. And instead of paying the Dolphins back, you know, I decided to come back and play for a couple more years. Okay. And when I came back, um, Bill Parcells became the president of the Dolphins and he took a liking to me, you know, and we sat down and we worked out a contract and he said, I'm going to make sure that, you know, you busted your ass. You're a good player. You play for us. I'll make sure to take care of you. So I was able to stack back up. Okay. Um, and that's when I was working with Peggy. Okay. And it, it was interesting. Like when I first met Peggy, I was like, this woman is crazy. You know, I'll never, never let her touch any of my money. Okay. And then some time went by, she was humbled. She went through some things. I went through some, through some things and we were both not at rock bottom, but we were both down here and we started to like climb back together, you know? And so I really trusted her. And I said, you know, we, we talked of dreams of building generational wealth ownership, you know? And so we started stacking and building little did I know she was living off off my paycheck. Okay. And I remember the moment, the moment that it, like it, I, I realized what was going on, you know, I like, I had this choice to make, you know, and, and I realized, you know, I said, when you get older, you know, you realize what it's really like. And I think when I was young, I thought I'll play however many years in the NFL and then I'll retire and do, do whatever I want to do. And that's what I was doing. I was doing whatever I want to do. And then I find out I don't have as much money as I thought. And I had this moment where I realized it's time to get creative. You know, and I realized, you know, if if this wouldn't have happened, I probably would have just like got fat and just got lazy, you know, but having to be creative, I started to say, what are the things I'm passionate about? And I'm going to go go full speed into them. 
And so I was able to get back on my feet and start hustling. And I realized that I had the capacity to generate income in ways that I, you know, I never, I never knew. Um, and so it, it turned into a, it turned into like a, a grind, a grind thing, you know, and I will say at the end of the day, I definitely appreciate, I appreciate my, my own value and I, and I appreciate what I have to offer and I appreciate the resources that I, that I make. But the truth is a large majority of everything that comes in goes right back out to my, to my businesses, you know, cause that's, that's my baby. Those are my babies. Those are my, those are my passion. And that's what I put all everything that I, that I have into. So we've had such a great conversation here, man. Truly, truly wonderful to sit down with you. And I think that brings us to a great point that we could kind of end on here. I know we could, first of all, we could talk for like a couple more hours easy, but I won't take up your whole day. But I love that you brought it back to, okay, I've been through this. I've been through that. I come full circle and I find these passions that can take me into the next chapter of my life. We've talked about those, astrology, um, cannabis, Heisman. What was the other company that you were CEO of? It's called it's called Alila, L-I-L-A. Yeah. Okay, exactly. So you have these different businesses that you're working in um, and working on. I think the simple way to to phrase this is like what's next you know like everyone loves to say that what's next what is happening in the and and honestly i love to say hey what's the next five ten years look like for you just because i'm like a a weird person about time like i like will be thinking about 2030 you feel me like like i'm just i'm just like that because i think it comes from being a history nerd and so you're always like cognizant like dude it was just 2002 you just had the rushing record. And you mean telling me it was 20 years ago, know. you know? So, so I know it's going to be 2042 and my kids are going to be my age now before I know it. Like, I know that's coming. Um, so when you think about that and you think about time and space and, you know, how we're all evolving as people and, and you're so in touch with your, like your spirituality and the cosmos, like, like, what is next, but not in a generic way? Like really what is next for someone who's been through what you've been through and has, has learned the lessons that you have? What can we expect out of your businesses like Heisman? And just like, where do you want to grow and evolve to as a person, as a man? Yeah, leadership, you know, and I, I think mainly thought leadership. So I, I see the future going two, one of two ways, okay? I feel like I'm, I'm trying to push for like a shift, like a major shift in, in the world and culture, you know? And I feel like if, if I can push hard enough and get enough people to push with me, okay, that you're going to see some kind of major leader thought leadership out of me. Okay. If not, I'm going to die trying, you know, and it might happen later, later, but I'm going to put everything I can into, into bringing what I know forward. So I feel like I'm an advocate for, for people's souls. You know, for what's on the inside, because we're we're so distracted and attacked by what's on the outside, right? And I think if no one speaks up for what's on the inside, we're in trouble. You know, so hopefully we'll we'll start to see this shift where people start to value it be inside the inside beauty more than they the 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 facade of what people think they're supposed to be doing. Great. Well. I'm expecting a lot of things from you, my man. Uh, thank you so much for, for keeping it all the way 100, joining us on the My Other Passion podcast today. Hope you had as good of a time as I did. Really learned a few things from this. So thank you for real. No, thank you for what you do, man. This is this is wonderful, you know, to Because, like, where I am in my life is is – People see that oh you're you're so vulnerable, but it's a challenge every day to keep pushing that that level. It's not like I stop and say right because every day I'm learning something new. I'm learning more and to to feel free to to express the things, even though I'm not sure how they're going to be taken. You know, and and you definitely made it easy for me to just to show up and be real. So thank you. Yeah, no, I'll say this. You know, we we glorify and as we should, we glorify like that breakthrough whether it's just something that happens personally or it happens in therapy or what have you, but that's hard. That's usually accompanied by a lot of tears, by a lot of regret, <laughs> by a lot of pain on the other yeah. side of it. You're a better person, but yeah. it's not easy. Um, yeah. A famous quote, nobody said it would be easy. Yeah, well said. <laughs> All right. 
my man good luck with everything and uh hit me up when you're up in my part of town i sure will that's a wrap on another episode of the my other passion podcast big thanks to ricky williams for coming out keeping it so real so open and honest and vulnerable every single second of that interview i learned a lot from that guy I feel like some of the stuff he was telling me I honestly needed in this moment. So I hope, you know, whether you're walking around with this in your AirPods or you're going on a long drive, I hope you feel the same way. And if you're enjoying the podcast, whether it's your first episode or you've been with us since the beginning, let the world know. Drop a tweet. Put it in your IG stories. At least get on Apple or Spotify and leave a review. Drop a comment on the YouTube. All of this counts. All of this makes it so that we can keep doing this, keep having great conversations. And with that said, there's a lot more on the way. We're going to be back next Wednesday. And I know every time I say, oh, more guests on the way, we're going to keep. We really are. We're just getting started. Thank you for your support so far. And we'll be back really soon. I'm out.